Good morning, my, mother, my brothers and sisters. It is good to be in the house of the Lord again. Amen? Amen. 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 The 150th number of Psalms says, Praise the Lord. Yes. Praise God in his temple. Yes. Praise him in his mighty heaven. Praise him for his strength. Praise him for his greatness. Praise him with trumpet blasts. Praise him with harps and lyres. Praise him with tambourines and dancing. Praise him with string instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with the crashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Let us praise the Lord, saints. This is our call to worship. We ask that you allow the Lord to lead you as we lift up the mighty name of Jesus in song, in prayer, and in God's holy word. Amen? Amen. Let us join Minister Payne and our children as they lead us in songs of praise. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, if you're happy to be in the house of the Lord, let's put our hands together. Let's stand to our feet and worship together with this hymn of the church that we all uh, should know. It goes something like this. What a fellowship.
Amen. Let us all strive to be all and everything God has called us to be. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Minister Payne and, and our young people for blessing us with those songs. And thank you, Eli, for leading Amen. in that last song. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning comes from 2 Timothy chapter 2, only one verse, and that is verse 15. And I'm sure most of us know this verse. From the International Children's Bible, it states as follows. Do the best you can to be the kind of person that God will approve and give yourself to him. Be a worker who is not ashamed of his work, a worker who uses the true teaching in the right way. Amen? Amen. That is the prayer for ourselves and for our children. Our deacons ministry will now lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just come before you this morning. Thank you for another day, another opportunity to come before you. Come to lift up your name. We come before you, Heavenly Father, in no short fashion or form, but we just come, Heavenly Father, that you lead and guide us according to your will. We ask a special blessing, Heavenly Father, upon those that are sick among us. We ask a special blessing upon Pastor Williams. We just ask you to be with and guide him and his family. Father, we just come before you now. I ask you to bless the word that's going to come forth. And so one may not know you on the part of their sins, that they will give their life to you today. Follow these things just ask in our son Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We thank Elder Dixon for that prayer. Uh, we know that there is power in prayer. Amen. Last Sunday we were reminded of the various prayers that we had lifted up to the Lord and that he had answered. And he continues to do what only he can do. Amen? Amen. Amen. First of all, we do want to uh, welcome all of our first term, first time and returning guests. If you did not get a, a welcome packet when you came in, uh, we ask that you uh, do get one uh, before you leave today. It's just a little bit of information that we would like for you to have uh, about our church family here and some resources for you. Amen? Amen. It is our tradition here at Mount Moriah. Uh, during part of our worship experience to remind ourselves of our vision, our mission, and our values. Uh, those are the elements that guide us as we go about doing those things that the Lord has called us to do. And so for our guests, we stand. If you'd like, you may stand as well. Uh, we have been uh, writing our vision, mission, and values on our hearts. And so we stand, and before we reveal all of them on the screen, uh, we're going to see just how far we have gotten. Amen? Amen. Amen. Our vision is? Transformed people everywhere. Amen. Trans transformed people everywhere. And to do that, our mission says that we develop disciples of Jesus Christ who edify communities and glorify God. And we've learned at least our first four or five values. Our first value is loving God and neighbor. Yes, loving God and neighbor. Our second value is being Christ, spirit, and word centered. Amen, amen. And our third value, being passionate about prayer. Amen. And our fourth value is being committed to the loss. And our fifth, which is a direct takeoff of our mission statement. Amen. Making disciples through our T groups or our transformational groups. And our next value is being committed to inspiring worship, serving community and families with relevance and innovation. Amen. Amen. You may be seated uh, in relationship to that seventh value, serving community. Uh, and families with relevance and innovation. Uh, you may have seen in our announcement loop, uh, first of all, that on this coming Saturday, beginning at 11 o'clock, uh, we will be hosting a Community Connect Festival. 
in the empty lot. So there'll be lots of games, food, and fun activities uh, for all ages, not just the kiddies, uh, but for uh, the older kiddies as well. So uh, if you want to try your hand at one of those traditional carnival games, uh, come on out and see what you can win. Everybody wins a prize. I'll just say that much. Amen? Uh, also, this week, uh, there will be a voters forum. There will be more information in Pastor Williams' email uh, that will be distributed. Also, as you probably know, next month, the second Sunday weekend, we begin the celebrations of our 135th church anniversary. At noon on Saturday, the 8th, we will host the grand opening of the Mariah Heritage Center, uh, which is a venue that allows us to share with the community the history of the church in North Omaha, amen, as well as the church uh, here at Mount Moriah and other sister churches, amen. Uh, and then on that Saturday, uh, should I say that Sunday, that's October 9th, our morning service will begin our anniversary celebration followed uh, by a meal here at the church, and then at 3 p.m. we will have our formal anniversary celebration, amen. 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 We, we pray that you're able uh, to attend those activities. Uh, last thing, uh, we do want to uh, let the Lord know how thankful we are for his goodness, his grace, and his mercy. Uh, First Chronicles 16 and 34 says, thank the Lord because he is good. His love continues forever. And one of the ways that we can thank the Lord for his goodness, his grace, and all of his sacrifices is to return to him just a small portion of what he's uh, given to us. Uh, we do so during our giving period. Our deacons are going to come forward at this time uh, to receive your offerings. Uh, we do ask that you use an envelope. There should be one uh, in the pews in front of you. If not, uh, let uh, the ushers know. Let Sister Russell know. And uh, we're going to uh, come forward uh, beginning with those who are seated in the outside aisles. Uh, if you would just uh, walk towards the walls and come to the front. If you are a first time guest or you have a connection card, uh, you may also place it uh, in the basket as well. Those in the center, if you would stand now, come forward please. Notice that there are also online giving options through Givelify and Tithely. generosity. Pray that the Lord will continue to bless you as only he can. Amen. Amen. Let's now prepare for the word uh, today brought to us by uh, Reverend uh, Nate Norval, our children and youth pastor here at Mount Moriah. Uh, he'll come to us in his own way following the next selection from Minister Payne and our children.
to have some angels watching over you every now and then, right? It's important that we sing songs that are undergirded with the Word, and the Bible says that He will command His angels concerning you. Amen? That your foot will not strike rock. That the enemy may try, but God has an army. And they watch over us at His direction and His command. Thank you, children, for reminding us that we have some angels that God has watching over us. Amen. There is a word from the Lord for us this morning. And if you're able, I would like you to turn with me to the 31st chapter of Jeremiah's prophecy. We're going to go Old Testament today. When we get there, we're going to frame our discussion about the discipline and the importance of studying our Bibles. That's our discipline. As we, we study disciplines, that's our discipline for the day, the studying of the Word of God. I will be in the English Standard Version, but whatever you have is fine. And we're going to start at the 31st verse of Jeremiah 31. God's Word says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on that day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, will for the, after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We're just going to talk about the new covenant today. Gracious God, we ask you to dwell among us, Lord. Send your spirit to have its way, to refresh, renew, and call us to you, Lord. God, we ask that you bless everyone within the sound of my voice, that they may hear your word and just feel your presence, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You know, one of the things that I use to measure my effectiveness as a parent is about uh, how my children respond to God if I did a good job teaching them. And I'm so happy that my daughter Naomi is in church today. She didn't know this, but Naomi has the, the distinction of being my sermon illustration today. Now she probably wishes she stayed home. <laughs> but recently, recently, Naomi and I, we went through an amazing father-daughter ordeal together. Girl dad, right? Um, Naomi had to purchase her first car. That is some stressful. Go, say amen for the first car. <laughs> God will do it. So that, that is a stressful time. Many of you were once young teenage women, I'm sure, buying your first car. And you remember the confusion, the stress, the you can't always get what you want, but sometimes you get what you need situation, right? Well, so Naomi and I, we went to all the lots around North Omaha, and she had a pretty good chunk of money saved up. I'm not going to put her business out there, but she did pretty good for herself. But this inflation thing, right, has gone crazy. I mean... You, you need 6K to get a car that'll get you from A to B now. Back in the day, 6K would have got me like a Mustang. I would have been doing all right. So Naomi, after going through about five lots, was panicked. You know, I'm not going to say she's anxious, but she might, you know, be anxious. And she says, Daddy, I, I, I don't have enough money to make this happen. How is this going to go down? Because you said you're going to stop giving me right, rides everywhere. I, I'm, the, I'm the mean dad. And I said, well, don't worry, you can make a payment. So she, she sits down with the dealer and she says, Dad, I, I, I still don't know, I, I, I still don't get it, how this is going to happen. And the guy whips out his calculator and he says something like, oh, don't worry, $269 a month. Naomi, can you handle it? Yeah, I can handle it. She says, okay. So she gives him the down payment and he starts handing over paperwork to her. And in this paperwork... There's sign on the dotted line stuff. Now, I have to sign because she ain't 19 yet, but as we go through this, I'm explaining the nature of the agreement. Right. right? This agreement spells out that Naomi is going to cough up X amount of money up front, X amount of money each month, 
And some of that's going to be interest because she couldn't afford to pay it up front, right? And in return, the dealership is going to give her this car, let her use it, though she does not yet own it. And one day, when she's paid off that crazy 18% interest rate, she's going to own the whole car outright and she'll get the title in the mail, amen? amen. This, this piece of paper defined the nature of the relationship. And as the kids sang this morning, we learned last week that agreement is, is another word for covenant. And, and we know that covenants don't just define our relationship with creditors. They define all of our relationships, right? Our professional labor, uh, relationships. My labor is given in exchange for the company's capital based on the number of hours I work and the tasks I perform. The friendships that we have, right? You have my back and I've got your back. That's a covenant relationship, right? Familial ones. Look, you don't always like your family, but you do things for them because they are your family. It comes with inherent responsibilities of love and care and prayer and holding one another up, right? Families are covenants and marriages. Hi, sweetie. To have and to hold till death do us part, even when I don't flush the toilet or put the seat down. It's a covenant till death. <laughs> Pastor said, say amen if you can, ouch if you can't. I don't want to hear no ouch out of you, Alexis. <laughs> uh, our relationship with God is no different. Amen? Uh, God interacts with us through covenants. You don't believe me? Let's, let's walk through the Bible. So first, there is this covenant with Adam, the Adamic covenant. Uh, God made all of creation, and he sets Adam in the garden and gives him dominion over this creation. Adam's job was to tend the garden, to take care of things. He got to name some animals, and he was the steward of God's handiwork, right? And in return, God was a provider. He was given the seed-bearing plants for food. God was a friend who walked with him in the cool of the garden. I mean, this is a pretty sweet deal. Adam got to hang out with God every day. But of course, Adam failed. The covenant was broken. We were tossed out of the garden unceremoniously. There were swords of fire guarding the entrance, and it's gone. We're out of there, right? Never to return. Then there's another one. There's the Noahic covenant. This is the agreement that God had with Noah. God looked down and saw that the hearts of men were continually evil, and God was so upset he repented that he made men, and he said, I'm going to destroy the whole of the world with this flood. But God finds in Noah a righteous man, and he says, look, I'm going to destroy the whole world, but go ahead and make this boat, load up some animals so we can repopulate some species, and I'll see you in 40 days, 40 nights. The, the, the flood comes, everything dies, 150 days later, the ground dries out, and Noah gets out of the ark, and he worships God. And at this time, God makes his promise, his covenant with Noah, and to all of mankind. He, he says, I'm never going to destroy you again with water. We were at war because of our sin, but God was so gracious, so, so perfect, so awesome, that he set down his bow, his keshef. It's a rainbow, we call it, but it's like a bow, and he set his weapon down in the horizon. And when we see it, we know... That God, being a God of his word, is not going to send a 40-day, 40 40-night 40 thunderstorm again. I'm glad I got sick of the one we had last night. And then we go to the Abrahamic covenant. God says, Abraham, I'm going to make you a father of an entire nation. You're going to have descendants as numerous as the stars. Kings are going to come out of you. I'm going to bless the whole world through you. I'm going to give you this land. It's flowing with milk and honey. You're going to love it. And, and, and you will be my people and I'm going to be your God. Now, our, our friend Abraham takes some strange and wicked and winding roads to get there, right? He lies about his wife, lets her sleep with the king of Egypt. Thank goodness she didn't get pregnant then, but she got, uh, she got her servant to get pregnant by her husband. It was Jerry Springer. Before there was Jerry Springer. Abraham is all over the board, but God is yet faithful. Because Isaac, the son of promise, is born. The patriarch line continues. The 12 tribes do form a mighty nation. They do inhabit the land of Canaan. Kings start coming out of the line of Abraham, including the eternal king. And through that eternal king, true to God's word, all the people of the world would be blessed. 
And you have the Mosaic Covenant. Let's talk about that one, right? God brings the people, the Hebrew people, out of Egyptian slavery. And while they're on their journey, Moses goes up on the mountain to talk to God. And when he comes down, there's this entire set of laws and rules and, and things that will govern the culture and society of the Hebrew people. God is moving them to their land. He's making them into the nation, just like he promised Abraham. But he had to reshape the people. He had to reshape their cultural norms. He had to reshape their laws. He had to reshape their society. He had to reshape even how he interacted with them. So he sends Moses down with this law. And it tells them how to live, how to love. It gives their society rules and order. It establishes the parameters of what is sin and what is obedience in the eyes of God. And then it even prescribes a method by which this sin can be atoned for, right? In, in, in return for their adherence to the Mosaic law, God agrees once again to be their people to watch over them, to love them, to provide for them and protect them. Again, pretty good deal, right? Last one, you have the Davidic covenant. And while this is another one that blessed mankind as a whole, it was initially between God and David. God promises David that he will have a child who, will, who is going to build his temple when he succeeds him and that his entire line of kings will endure forever. But David messed up, right? Looked out the window top, saw something he shouldn't have seen. Then he went and did something he shouldn't have done. Then he tried to cover up what he shouldn't have tried to cover up. And the whole time, God's like, if you would have just asked me in the first place. But God's a merciful God. He says, don't worry, David. You're not going to build this temple that I gave you vision for because you're unrighteous. But your son that will come out of you, he's going to take care of it. You messed up, but the vision isn't dead. My will is still going to be done. And God kept his word. Solomon was born, the wise king, and the temple was constructed. And the line of David is still going strong to this day. Right. Mm. Congratulations, Mount Moriah. You just took a class on covenant theology. Well. <laughs> what took eight weeks, you did in eight minutes. Right. All right, ten minutes. <laughs> and why is it important? Because we need to understand the nature and the terms of our relationship with God. Just like Naomi sitting at the desk with the car dealer... There's some fine print, y'all. There's some responsibilities that we have and some offered amenities that God put in this thing. And even though these covenants have changed over the years, they're still covenants, right? So God says through Jeremiah, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. I love how upfront and matter-of-fact God is, right? Kind of like Babe Ruth just calling his shot. You knew exactly what God is going to do. He tells you, right? He says, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. If God's making a new covenant, it's because the old one wasn't doing the job, right? Or it was fulfilled. So now all these covenants we talked about, they're very different, right? Some are built upon the previous ones, right? The Mosaic one kind of expands on the covenant he had with Abraham, as did the covenant of David, right? But they are uniquely established agreements, these covenants, this one, is going to be new and different, God says. He says, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on that day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the, hand of, of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Excuse me. So this covenant was going to be different than the previous one. Different than the Mosaic covenant we talked about a few moments ago. It's separate. Why is God insistent that this covenant be so different? Because God wants a different result, amen? If you, if you, if you listen, listen to the language of this text. He says, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the, out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. God has hurt his feelings. God's scorned. God is angry. God is disappointed in how this situation turned out. It's not that he didn't know, but just because you know something doesn't mean it doesn't affect you. God is, is upset. He has emotions, right? He was the faithful husband who snatched his bride by the hand, took her out of Israel, delivered her from slavery, and this woman was low down. She was quarrelsome. She was out way past when she should have been out at night. She was an unfaithful woman, that is real. She was a nag. Grandma would have called her a hussy. She was a problem. And if you want to know what kind of woman Israel was on your own time, read the book, The Prophecy of Hosea. The whole thing is the allegory of the unfaithful wife. You'll love it. It's a great story. 
But God was the good husband nonetheless. He isn't going to just give up on Israel yet. He just wants a different result, Pastor. Uh, and and if, 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 let me if I tell you what I tell my single friends. If you want something different and achieve something that you've never done, then you have to be willing to do some things that you've never did. So God is breaking out a new covenant, y'all. A different covenant. And for this covenant, he says that he will make it with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. That sounds different. And I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Same result, different pathway, right? And these are the terms of this agreement. Instead of the law existing outside of us, right, as something that we're to learn and read and follow, it's now going to be placed within us. Hmm. Same, same kind of law, same God, same desired result, but the methodology is different here. And God reaffirms that he will be our God and will be our people. I played with some pronouns there, and I'll explain why I did that in a few minutes here. Uh, but God continues, he says, And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. Uh, look, look and see how that changes things, right? Uh, the people don't have to evangelize the people anymore. Uh, from, from all the people are going to know the Lord, it says. From the bottom of the society to the top of the society, this covenant is going to be for kings and peasants alike. That's good news because I ain't nobody's king. The people of God are going to know God now for themselves. Uh, when his law is in your head and your heart, you're going to know him. And last part, God says, For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. Once again, that is a good deal, y'all. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. So if this new covenant here is giving me an opportunity to have God forgive my sins and forget them. Yeah. Hey, man, sign me up. <laughs> That's an easy decision, right? Yeah. The primary consequence of this new covenant is that the membership in the covenant will erase all the things we have done. I told y'all this is a good deal. And that's the text of it. But, but before we go home, let's talk about why it matters. Why, what are the finer points, right? What's the interest rate? What's the terms? Let's talk about some amortization. All right, first, this covenant, this new covenant, will redefine our identity. Israel was God's chosen people, right? And these covenants kind of shaped those early interactions between God and people. But the people, as we pointed out, failed to keep most provisions of this covenant, right? So, so with this new covenant, God decided to open it up to anybody who wanted to be a part of it. That is good news. To borrow a phrase from today's vernacular, God is practicing some open enrollment, right? You don't have to be a part of the nation of Israel to sign on the dotted line. But that's because God changed the definition of Israel, when our text begins, God says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Notice there is division here. Israel, Judah, separated kingdom, separated people, differentiated by space, by governance. There's fracturing within the greater kingdom here on earth, right? The kingdom is not unified. But in 33, watch how God switches it. He says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. Where is Judah in this thing? Oh, man. And they were the good kingdom, right? <laughs> Why is only Israel mentioned here? And the answer is that this covenant is going to unify the people of God under one banner, right? Uh, it's not just going to be the nations of Israel and the nation of Judah, but all of God's people, right? This covenant is not for the nation of Israel, but it is for the people Israel. There's a difference between a country and a people, y'all. You, you can't come to God today by the virtue of sharing Abraham's bloodline. But I promise you, you can come to God today by sharing in Abraham's faith. Uh, so as we believe and we grow our faith, we are grafted into Israel. We get adopted into the family, y'all. Hallelujah for adoption. All of us. That's why I switched from saying they and them and I went to us and we, there's a reason behind that because we 
Gentile Christians all are now Israel. That new covenant ain't for them, it's for us. Important detail, right? The covenant in itself redefines our identity. Next, the covenant redefines our interaction with God. This is important. This is kind of how we, we get to the Bible study part of it, right? Back in the day, God communicated to his people through prophets and through priests, and he, he governed his people through the law, which was recorded and placed and told throughout the land. But here's the problem with that. If I communicate to you, right, strictly through a messenger, there is a good opportunity and a good chance that every so often that message is going to get lost or that message is going to get altered, right? If I govern you through recorded law and rely on you to learn it, take it to heart, and obey it, I mean, every so often I blow through that stop sign. Not perfect. Simply put, we aren't reliable enough to operate under the old covenant. It wasn't God's failing. He kept his part. He was their God, was their people. But we couldn't get this thing right. You could change my name to can't get right. Can't do it. Not because I don't care, not because I don't try, but because I can't do it. Right? We're inadequate. We're fickle. We change with the wind. We're, most, we're sinful. We're warped. And because of this, things go wrong a lot. Way often, way more often than they should. So doing something different to get a different result. This time God says, I'm going to put my law within them. I'll write it on their hearts. See, the communication problem is solved because we are now internalizing God's word, right? He, he, we, we who are now part of this covenant, we have it inside of us. Huh? How is that? I'm glad you asked. So the moment you believe, the Holy Spirit, who is God, by the way, takes up residence inside of you, right? You become that temple. You fulfill part of the Davidic covenant, right? Uh, which means that you have a direct connection with God. No intermediary is necessary. So when we deal with temptation and sin, God is already there to nudge us, to protect us, to convict us, to say, I told you not to do that mess. I told you not to post that on Facebook. That's my testimony. Woo! My delete button is broken. When God needs to talk to us, He's right there. Ain't nothing but air and opportunity, right? Now, what happens, because communication is a two-way street, what happens when we need to talk to him, Minister Payne? Well, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit gives us utterances. He tells us when to pray, what to pray, how to pray, when it's time to pray. That's the new covenant, right? God is inside of you telling you what to say to God. Talk about having an inside guy, right? This fixes the communication problem. Now, what about this governance thing? Here's the Bible study. Under the old covenant, you had priests and scribes, teachers, those guys that used to walk around harassing Jesus, pushing their glasses up, right? They did whatever they could, and I think most of them probably did so with a reasonably good intention, to teach the people about the law. They tried, but they're inadequate. Why? They're people. And in this new covenant, the word of God is available to everyone. It's the number one bestseller. No book has been printed more than the word of God. We don't need a priest or a Pharisee or a, or, or, or a Sadducee or somebody from the Sanhedrin to come tell us. We don't got to roll out scrolls in the synagogues on Sunday morning. You leave this church today, if you choose to, that Bible's in your house waiting for you when you get home. You can study more, study with your neighbor, study with your sister, study with your mom, study with your kin, your cousin, your auntie, twice removed. You have the word of God at your disposal. Right. And here's the cool part of this. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each one of his brothers saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. Yeah. Is that telling you that you don't have to evangelize? No. No, it says, no longer shall each one, each one, each member of the covenant. I don't have to go to, to, to Sister Joyce and say, Sister Joyce, did you know that the Lord said, because if Sister Joyce is part of the covenant, 
She's already reading the Word of God, has already internalized the Word of God, has already understood, discerned, meditated, and kept going and building on her understanding of the Word of God. The people don't have to teach each other. Now, we got to still teach the folk, but us, we're on equal standing. We lead, but we're no more holy. We're not high priests. And no longer shall they teach one another. And, and they will all know the Lord, for they all know me, and the least of them to the greatest, right? This is so important. From the little ones, children, Bible study Wednesday night, to the greatest ones, T groups, right? The way we go about this thing is changing. You don't have to go to church Sunday morning to hear the word of God. You can study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth by yourself. Read your Bible. The unfolding of your word gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. You should read your Bible. The word of God is quick and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. You should read your Bible. Thy word is a lamp under my feet and a light unto my path. You should read your Bible. The book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you shall make your ways prosperous and you shall have good success. Read your Bible. Faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, read your Bible. Read it and meditate on it. It's not just a personal discipline. It's part of your fine print. It's written in your head, logos. It's living in your heart, pathos. You better have some word in you if you're going to be part of this covenant. And lastly, this covenant redefines how we are seen by God. This text says, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more, deacon. Woo! The text does not say, for they will sin no more, and I'm not going to have a reason to get angry. God is not expecting human nature to change. He knows, right? But this covenant changes things. Let's unpack that. As it was in the days of Noah, the hearts of men are continually set on evil, y'all. Y'all been out those doors? This thing is going crazy. Politics are going crazy. Uh, conflict within the church over what this thing is supposed to look like. Not this church, but the church, right? There's wars and rumors of wars. California's on fire. Colorado's got earthquakes and mudslides. Jesus called them birthing pains. We're going into labor, y'all. This is not getting better anytime soon. But that's all right. Do I look scared? Do I look bothered? Nope. We are still dealing with sin and disobedience. We're still unrighteous, unholy enemies of God. But as we believe in Jesus, we are justified. That's a big theological term. We go through justification. That's, uh, it's not that our actions have stopped being sinful. Amen. It's that we don't have to have any further penalty associated with those actions because someone took care of it. Right. Naomi, how would you feel if you went in to make your car payment next month and the guy says, oh, ma'am, someone paid in full. <laughs> don't get your hopes up. And, and not only that, this is where it really takes a hard right for the better. He says, what car note? I don't even show you ever had a debt. There's a difference there. I pay your bill. They still got records. I like expungement. All has been forgiven when you believe because you're justified if you're part of this new covenant. Sounds simple, but it was anything but simple, brothers and sisters. To accomplish this, to fulfill that new covenant, God had to sign his name in blood. See, the first covenant, the Adamic covenant, it said that when they were pushed out of the garden, God sewn together some, some animal skins to cover their nakedness. 
But if you've ever had a Davy Crockett hat, after a while, you know that thing starts to dry out, crust up, and fall apart. That covenant, that covering wasn't permanent. And then the Mosaic law came and it said, man, if you sin, you're going to give all the sins to the high priest. And the high priest is going to go in the holy of the holies and some heifers and some goats and some, some, some uh, cows. And sometimes you get the, 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 the birds, they'd be slaughtered. And then their blood would be splattered on the Ark of the Covenant. And the chief priest would walk out. But there's only one problem. The minute he walks out, you already cheated on your husband. You've already slapped somebody. You cussed somebody out under your breath. You done stole something, ran off with a car that wasn't yours. It's already sideways because... Who's got more animals? <laughs> Worst case scenario, the high priest didn't come out and somebody had to yank him with the rope. Y'all were real bad. It didn't work. Not because God, he told us what to do. We just, we goofed it up. We didn't listen. So God wants to achieve the same result, but has to take into account how we are and comes up with a new covenant and says, you know what? I know you're going to sin. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He said that through Paul, but it was his words, right? But the wages of sin are death. It's not changing. God is not saying, you know what? It is okay if you do all these horrible things I told you not to. God isn't turning a blind eye. He's a just God. He says, no, 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 no. I got this. I'll be right back. So God comes down as one of us while still God. Fully man, fully God. Not a half and half, not a weird mutant, not an X-Men. God comes down, wrapped in flesh. His name is Jesus. He's born in a manger in a little town called Bethlehem. There's a star that prophesies his coming. People come from miles around, frankincense and myrrh and gifts of gold. And Jesus is here, y'all. God is on the scene. Because you can't sign a contract if you're not there. I don't trust that DigiSign, DigiSign stuff. I've had my email hacked. I'm sensitive. So he shows up and he does what God and only God could do. If you're blind, let me help you see. Just believe, sin no more. If you're sick, come to me, I'll heal you. Just sin no more. They're associated sickness and sin. Let me take care of both. You need a miracle? I'm God. He does what only he can do. <laughs> the problem with the New Covenant, though, it fights on the surface with the Old Covenant. The people in charge, those scribes and Pharisees, they don't know what's going on. They don't get it. Hey, man, we're supposed to be doing these things, and not on the Sabbath, by the way. What are you doing, blasphemer? They really just didn't want to lose power. They're jealous. Because no matter how many scrolls they read, no matter how many sacrifices they gave wasn't nobody going to get up and walk. Wasn't no one going to lose their leprosy. Jesus was doing their job differently and better than they ever could. So they brought him before kings of the world, the king of kings. And they said, crucify him, even though they just said, Hosanna, son of David, save us. Short memory, four days. Just completely changed the narrative. Crucify him. And they did because it was politically expedient. Jesus was hung on the cross of Calvary after a beating you can't even imagine for stuff you did, for stuff I did. But he stayed there on that cross. He could have called down legions of angels, put the Romans right back in their place, showed the Sanhedrin what real power looked like, what real anointing and appointing looked like. But instead, he took every lash that was meant for me. He stayed there on that cross all night Friday. He stayed there all day Saturday. He stayed there all night Saturday. And then he went down to hell, kicked open the doors, and set the captives free. And he wasn't done. Because the Bible says that early on the first day, my Jesus got up with all power in his hands. The grave that was meant for him couldn't hold him. The grave that they planned and plotted could not keep him. He was whipped. He was transgressed for our transgressions. But by the stripes on his back, we're healed. The covenant is signed. All you got to do is do your part. Believe in the Lord. 
Trust that he is God. Trust that he has redeemed you and has paid your debt, Naomi. You ain't got a car bill, girl. God did what no one else can do. Because God is who no one else is. Read your Bible and he'll tell you about it. Discipline yourself to studying what God has for you. That's his way of revealing himself to us. You can't be in a relationship with someone you don't know. If you want to know the Lord who died for you, who got up for you, and who has active plans on coming back for you, read his word. Read his word. It's a love letter. It's the romance novel of redemption. Read his word. We have done as the Lord has commanded, and all we have to do is extend the invitation. If you are here today and you have not trusted in the Lord, won't you do it? Sign the contract. You don't have to sign in blood. <laughs> he will save you. He will save you just now. Just come to Jesus. If you're watching at home or online, 402-451-8800. Cortez, can you put that up? Thank you. If you're watching at home, give us a call. Someone will answer that phone and help you take the next steps. They'll schedule the appointment to sign the paperwork. Trust in the Lord with all your mind, your body, and soul. Come to Jesus just now. observations before we get out of here. Uh, Pastor has already reminded you about the Community Connect Festival, but associated to that, uh, setup is going to be at 9 o'clock next Saturday morning. And as much as is possible, I need this to be an all-hands-on-deck event. This is going to be a big teamwork, make the dream work moment. So if you can be here at 9 a.m. next Saturday to help with setup, I would greatly appreciate it and God will get the glory. Uh, also, to that end, I have stacks of flyers for this event. Um, I would like to give everybody that was willing to pass them out to friends, family, co-workers, about 10 flyers each. Come see me after service. I'll cut you a bundle and off you go. Um, next week, Thursday night, the children are going to a baseball game. Deacon Larry and I are taking them out to the old ballpark. So we have 20 seats. If you would like to go, or, or the kids are like Kamari, if they're not here and they want to go, please let me know. I'll, I've got a running list and we'll get the kids to the ballpark. Um, I would also like maybe one adult female who would like to endure a baseball game. I know women don't usually like baseball. That's all right. Um, that would like to come, you know, poor Jakaya, and, and she's going to need someone to hang out with her. <laughs> she's like, she's going to be grotesquely outnumbered at this event, so help her out. Uh, lastly, Sister Dinah, if I could bug you after church for just a wee few, Pastor had some retail therapy. So maybe Sister Yvette too. Let us stand.
when you leave here today, you know, COVID is, is still going on. Please exit. I'm not kicking you out, but please leave the sanctuary as expeditiously as possible and as safely as possible. Amen. Gracious God, we thank you, Lord, for your work and your word. God, we thank you that it is in our hearts, in our heads, that we have it dwelling within us, Lord. We thank you for your spirit that dwells there as well, God. And as we leave this place, but never your presence, God, we ask that you go with us, giving us traveling grace and the strength and reminder to always share the word and make disciples as we go. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his joy, his peace, and his love. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So loved the world that he gave, he gave his only son, and the son gave his life for me when he died. to count the